pray and we'll get started, all right? Father, we thank you so much that we have the opportunity to be here this morning. Father, we ask that you help us to be a people that loves and serves you every single day. Help us to learn those things today. Father, it truly is a privilege to be, a, a, be able to meet together, to study together, to worship together, to fellowship together. Uh, those are privileges that we have because of you. And we, uh, we understand that. We ask your blessings upon us as we, as we do all of those things this morning. They will be pleasing to you, and it will be beneficial to us. Father, those that are watching online, I pray for each one of them. I know that some of them can't be here because of, because of health reasons. Some are watching from all over the place. And I just pray, Father, for each one of them. I pray that, uh, that they will grow and learn and, and be able to apply the things they learned this morning in their lives as well. Father, bless us. Be with, we pray, Father, that you be with Wayne in that whole situation. We pray for his doctors and his family and just everything that's going on there. We just pray your blessings upon him. Thank you again for loving us. Thank you for bringing us here. Help us to have a great morning. Help us to have a great worship. And, Father, we, we, uh, we thank you so much for all of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A couple of things I want to, I know Dan's going to have an announcement this morning. I want to make sure that you guys get it. If you, uh, if, I know it's early yet. If you have not signed up to help with Bible, I mean with uh, Trunk or Treat, make sure you do that. We're going to need a lot of volunteers. I'm going to keep pounding it to you and pounding it to you and pounding it to you. You know, we're going to run 1,000, 1,500 people through this parking lot, and, and we've got to have a lot of people volunteering to help, okay? So don't be, don't be, uh, don't be bashful. Just, uh, just nobody's asking you to put on a costume and act like a fool. That's not what we're asking. Just to, just to volunteer to do something. There's a whole bunch of sign-up sheets over there. There's a whole bunch of things you can get involved in, things that can be obscure or things that you can be out in the forefront, whatever you want to do. So please, please don't forget to sign up for that, okay? Uh, one more thing. Guys, guys, don't forget we have sun, We have breakfast next Saturday, all right? Next Saturday morning we have breakfast, all right? Uh, we will, uh, and and if you, if you don't have it come before, remember, we've got some little kids that come, some little guys that come with their, with their dads. You can be a great example to those guys just by showing up and being there, just by letting them see that that you are you are connected to the other men here, okay? So just keep that in mind when you make the decision whether you're going to come or not. Uh, it's only for an hour, you know. It's only for an hour, and you're going to get good food to boot. So I mean, it's going to be a great breakfast. It's going to be a great opportunity of fellowship, and uh, and it's just it's just a great time. So anyway, all right, we're in Second Timothy chapter three. All right. So, <clears throat> Paul is charged to Timothy and to the church there at Ephesus, and I think into us as well about false teachers. This is where he's going to really start and really show, you know, for the next two chapters, he's really going to deal with this a lot. Okay, so uh, we're going to be at this for a while, but uh, that. These false teachers, their basic premise is they're going to bring opposition to the truth. They're going to bring, they're going to bring a, a, a form of, of godliness from their perspective that doesn't have anything to do with the truth. And we have to be aware of that. And I want you to, before I read these verses, I want you to do something for me. I want you to pay very close attention to what I'm fixing to read. All right? I want you to pay attention to the verses and ask yourself. I want you to ask yourself, does this look familiar? Does it look familiar to you? Either in your own life, or in the life of the church that you're involved in, or in, involved in the world that you're involved in. Okay, just ask yourself: Is this? Do I? Is is this familiar to me? All right. Listen to what he says. But mark this: There will be ter terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous. Without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness that, but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. Does it sound familiar? Do you see anything in there that looks familiar to you? Okay, I want to I want to clarify. This one, mark this, put it down, put a check mark by it, put an X on it, mark this. Listen, if you don't listen to anything else, listen to this. He said in the last days. Okay, what days is he talking about? He's talking about the end of time. What days is he talking about? What days is he talking about? Now? Can you prove that? Can you prove it? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Go back to Acts chapter 2. 
Well, I had some people say no. And I said, yeah, you can. You can prove it. Look at Acts chapter 2. Now, if you know anything about this text, this is the text where Peter gets up and, and preaches a sermon to the Israelites at, at the day of Pentecost that are standing there around him, and they are the same ones, many of them, that crucified Jesus himself. They're the ones that put him on the cross. They're the ones that were hollering for his hide on a plate. Okay? And so, if you look at chapter 2, and, he's, and he, Peter's going to get up and he's going to preach out of the prophet Joel. Okay? Now, listen to what he says. Starting in verse 15. These people are not drunk, as you suppose, because they had gotten up. The Holy Spirit came upon these, the, these, these apostles, and they were speaking in other languages. And the people heard them talking in their own language. These guys would get up and talking, and they were talking. And these guys, these guys are drunk. They must be drunk. And he said, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It will, if, I'm in verse 15 in chapter 2. These people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only 9 in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Okay? He quotes the prophet Joel. Listen to what he said. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. When did he say we're going to do this? And what did Peter refer to? In the last days. So when is that time frame? Now, then and now. The last days are, we living in the last days. We are living in, the, there's no, there's nothing else coming, guys. There's no Abraham rule. There's no Mosaical law. It's now. This is where we are. We're living in the last day. It's the last epoch of time. There is no more time coming. When Jesus comes back, it's over. There's not going to be another, there's not going to be another time frame. There was two, two time frames before. The Abram time frame and the Mosaical law time frame. Now we got another one. This is the time frame of the Messiah. He said in the last days, what Prophet Joel did, and Peter uh, refers to that and says, in the last days, this is, and he tells them, this is what you're seeing. You're seeing this unfold for you right now. So when he says over here, in the last days, when you know, it was it was in their day, we're in, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 3, for those of you who just walked in. He said, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days, okay? We've dealt with, we know what the last days are, it's our time frame. We're living in these time frames. And I asked you, when you looked at this, I said, did you see anything that looks familiar to you? Did you? Huh? <laughs> all of it. Mark said all of it. You see anything look familiar? Because I'm going to ask you in a little bit if it looked familiar in your own life. Okay? Does it look familiar in your own life? Maybe not all of them, but maybe some of them. He said in the last days, There'll be terrible times in the last days. That word terrible times only happens one other time. It's in Matthew chapter 8. We're not going to go over there. But it's where there's two demons, or there's two guys, and the, they're demons death, and it says, it says they were violent. It is the exact same word. It's only two times it happens. So in terrible times, this is violent. He said, in, he said it's going to be violent time, depraved time, difficult time. You know, I looked up the word. It said men, hard to bear, troublesome, dangerous, violent. That's what the word means. He said there'll be terrible times. That it's it's way it's violent. Okay, it's troublesome, hard to bear, hard to deal with. And he said, and he lists all these things here. He lists all these things that all these character traits. Eighteen of them he lists. Eighteen character traits of the of the ungodly, unholy, unsupervised. You know, people can, go, running away from God and not towards Him. So. I want to ask you a question. Has there ever been in your life a mentor in your life, spiritual, physical mentor in your life, that you listened to and, and taught you different things in life? Did you have that in your life? Timothy's got Paul. Okay? So when Paul sits down with, to write this letter and he's writing to Timothy and he says, God, let me tell you something. In the last days, this is what's going to happen. Be aware of it. Mark this down. Okay? There's terrible times coming. You're seeing it now. You'll see it even more. And it will get more and more progressive. It will progress more and more as it gets closer and closer to the end. People are saying, oh, you see the end's coming. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know when that's going to happen. I have no idea. I don't particularly, I don't care. I really don't care. You know why I don't care? Because he's going to come back for somebody today. All right? You know, we just found out this morning about somebody that 
that Jared knows that just lost their husband. Their husband just died. Got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and died. So, you know, he needs to come back with somebody today. When he comes back for good, I don't know when that is, and I really don't care. I just want to be ready. And I want as many people that I talk, that I know to be ready as well. So we have to pay attention to this stuff. Is he is he writing to me? Am I am I someone he yeah, I think he's writing to all of us. Not just to Timothy. I need to be aware of what he's saying here. You know, I'm not gonna go through every one of these eighteen of these. Man, you know what they say. Unholy, ungodly, a godly you know, I will deal a form of godliness, but denying its power. What kind of form of godliness? You know, outward show. How many people do you know that that talk God but don't live God? They talk a godly a lot godly life, but they don't live a godly life. You know, they say, "Oh, how I love Jesus!" At the same time, they're trying to stick you with a knife. You know, people like that. There are people in the world all over like that. There are people in our lives. There are people in our families like that. They they, they profess a form of godliness, but they but they don't they deny the power of God. And you, do you understand what he says when he says, "But denying the power"? Do you understand what God's power is capable of? You have any idea? You have any idea? Holds all the world together. <laughs> Holds all the world together. He created it all. You know, <laughs> when you when you watch your life and you watch the tragedy and the chaos happen over and over and over, <clears throat> and you see it happen, <clears throat> and marriage is going south, your lifestyle, your attitude, job goes south. Everything going south, and you stand pat, stand firm. You say, I'm not going to let, and, and, and it seems like the whole avalanche is caving in on top of you. And you go get some help. And you get somebody to talk to you, somebody that can mentor you, some people that can mentor you, and you let them talk to you. And you find yourself, you find yourself not growing, but just standing firm, planted. I'm not going to let it push me over. I won't. And then all of a sudden, Rain showers come and the flowers start blossoming. And you start to see things happen in your life. You start to see good stuff happen. And things that are happening that, that can benefit you and benefit your, your family and benefit your, your children and your mate and all that. And then benefit people around you. And you say, wow, man, ain't I something of what? No, you're not. God's power just showed up in your life. That's what's happening. God's power showed up. We don't give him enough credit, guys. We look at a mirror and say, hey, I'm all that, man. No, you're not. You ain't all that. On your best day, you ain't all that. On your best day, you pale in comparison to anything anything resembling all that. But you know who is all that? God is. And God loves us. You love your children? You love your children, Joey? What would you do for them? What would you not do for them? There's not a lot you wouldn't do for them, right? Now, they may not see that. They may say, well, I don't like it. You didn't help give me this. Well, you know, I can't give you that because it's not good for you. You're going to do everything you can to bless and to nourish and to nurture your children, right? What do you think God's going to do? I've told you this before. This isn't a new concept, guys. I've told you this before. God loves us as his children. He wants everything for us. And, you know, here he said, Paul's writing to Timothy and saying, man, be aware of this stuff. I'm telling you, in the last day, this is going to get pronounced. Now, and I ask you, did you ever see, did you ever have a, a, a mentor, a role model in your life? Did you ever have one? Who was, you know, just a few. Who was a, who was a role model in your life that, that, that moved you forward, moved you to a good place, or was striving to move you to a good place? Whether you went there or not, it didn't matter. But was trying to move. Do you have a role? Timothy can say, well, Paul was. I can say Dwayne Weaver was in my life. Dwayne Weaver was a, was a mentor in my life when I really needed it. Yeah, Chad. Me? Thank you. Thank you. Good. I mean, that's always humbling to hear that. You know, I mean, it's what you try to do. You try to be that, but sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it, you know, sometimes you have to say things to people that are, that are not kind. I watched that this morning, and it was, uh, I went, I was, but the, you know, I wish you'd have been there. I mean, it was going, whoa. And it, but it was, it was exactly what needed to be said at the right time. And I just didn't know to say it because I was, I'm not, I'm not trained that way. But, but you know, mentors do that. You know, they do the, what, 
you know, Paul is mentor, is mentor to Timothy and said some things to him that maybe Timothy really didn't want to hear, right? Who else? Who is? Who's some, yes, ma'am. My mother. Your mother. Nina was a, was an awesome lady. I remember her. Not a lot, but I do remember her. She was a, she was something. You know. What? What? Anybody else? Yes, yes, ma'am. My stepdad. Your stepdad. Jack Nancy. Yes. Come here. Yes, ma'am, Carmen. So the ladies at a church used to attend were, were mentors to you. You know, when when you look at this and you say, uh, what did we? What did you learn from them? What did you, what did you learn from from these people? Did you learn how to stand up? Did you learn how to sit down? What What did you learn? You know, mentors teach us all kinds of things. Teach us do this, don't do that. Say that, don't say that. You know, all kinds of things mentors teach us. Okay, you know, Paul is being that mentor. You know, what I want to ask you. Why do you think these characteristics that he lists here, 18 of them, why do you think they're becoming so prevalent today? <clears throat> why do you think we're seeing them more prevalent? Because I'm looking at this list, and I know where I came from, okay? I know where I grew up. I grew up, I was born in 51, and so I grew up in the, in the heyday of the 60s. You know, I was in, you know, I graduated in 69, and so, I, that, so it was a different culture. You saw some of this, but not like this. It's different today, right? Would you say that it was different? I mean, there was some of it, but not to this extreme. What do you think? What do you think happened? What do you think happened? They rejected God. They rejected God. Do you think? I I know that, that, that um, I saw a survey the other day. It said that uh, said that that sixty percent of the, the survey said sixty percent of the people uh, that they surveyed decided they don't want to go to church anymore. They don't have nothing to do with God. Sixty percent of them. I think back back in my day, I think it was like twenty five percent. So it's it's got it's gotten more from you know. So God's gotten out of the picture, right? I would say you know we we took him out of school, couldn't pray. I remember, I remember, you know, having the responsibility one day of going to the going to the office and and having to put sit in front of that microphone and do the Lord's prayer in the morning. I remember, I still remember doing that. I was scared to death. And I, and I sit recite the Lord's Prayer to the whole school. And, and I'm going, you, know, you can't do that anymore. Somebody else had their hand up. Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, I think my focus changed. Um, it's almost in our life. It's generational. Yeah. It's okay, so not putting children first. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> they put them first instead of God. Okay, so they put, so they put children first. Because if you hear and hear about children not obeying their parents, all of a sudden you're thinking, okay. Okay, so we... So we've trained our children to do some of these things. That's what you're saying. As, as, yeah. Okay. So Somebody, yes, ma'am. I think technology. It, technology? It's instantaneous gratification. Okay. You know, everything, technology? Everything's instantaneous. Yeah. I take Connor to school sometimes. Uh, a couple times a week, maybe. And uh, and I get him there right at 8 o'clock. The door's supposed to open at 8 o'clock. And because it's right on my way, I'm going in town, so I, I let him off. And I see the, their kids are all standing out there. It's all sixth graders. They don't. They don't. They don't connect. The sixth and seventh graders aren't, aren't put together. They just have sixth graders. And uh, and uh, about 75, 80 percent of them are like this. Yeah. The other day, Connor had something after school, and he has no phone, so he couldn't call his dad. So his dad had to go up there and wait on him without no 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 phone or nothing. But that's the way we used to do that. You know, and Kevin's attitude was, he ain't getting a phone. He's not getting a phone. If I get him a phone, I'm getting burnt a phone. And he's going to be able to call and receive calls and, and make calls. That's it. He's not getting a phone. You know, you've got, you know, the parents today, you know, I, I, I've, seen, I've seen three and four-year-olds that have phones already. Oh, Are you yes. kidding me? Oh, yes. why, don't, why don't you just open up the Internet for them? <laughs> just say, here, have fun. I'm going to go over here. You just have fun. I think there's a lot of situations, a lot of things that have happened that, that have promoted this kind of thing. I think it's going to get worse instead of getting better. If we don't get back to God, if we don't get back to the importance of the family, I think I think we're done. I think we're done. I think this nation as a whole is done. I think it will be no different than any other nation you see if we don't get a handle on this stuff. You know, my concern is not for the for the nation, not for the world. My concern is for you in this class. What are you going to do? You know, and I and I want to tell you, 
Do you see any of these sinful behaviors that you have? Do you see any of these character traits in your own life? Do you see them? And what is, if anything, can I do about it? He tells us in this text, he says, stay away from these people. Stay away from them. Okay. Well, then I'm, I'm saying, well, how can I mentor them? How can I, how can I be an impact on them? How can I do? That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, don't get tangled up with them. All right? Don't get tangled up with them. Don't get involved, entwined with them. All right? That's hard to do, isn't it? Yeah. Why do you think that it why do you think it's important not to get entangled with them? Why do you think that's important? Well, if you're not strong in your faith, they'll pull you over. Not to get you. Yeah. Go ahead, David. It poisons your soul to be around people like that. They can. It can, not necessarily always, but it can. It can poison your soul. You know, you 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 get in the in the middle of a. I mean, slowly you, poison. Huh? Slowly poison. Slowly poison. Okay. You jump into a into a cesspool. What's going to happen to you? You're going to get dirty and stink, right? What's the best thing to do? Don't jump in the cesspool, right? There was one of my grandparents out. This is all. This is old man. It's old school. They had a they had a, a hole way down at the end of a thing. I didn't know how all that worked, but my grandfather dumped it from time to time and. Uh, I, I knew one thing. We weren't ever going to play around there. <laughs> we were playing out there, man. That's for sure. Because it was that was nasty. But, you know, that's that's kind of, you know, when you look at the prodigal son and, he, and he's laying in a pig pen and, and he's feeding pigs and longing to eat what the pigs are eating, you know, that's that's pretty bad, right? He says, stay away from them. So what do I have? If I, if I start to see these characteristics in my own life, what do I need to do? What do you need to do? Yep. He says avoid, avoid them. them. Avoid them. Stay away from them. Okay. Stay away from them. That's great to a point. Yeah. That's easy to do to a point. What happens if they don't look bad to you? What happens if what happens if it doesn't if it doesn't look like that well there's nothing wrong here. I mean this is okay. Everybody else is doing it. You know, I mean I mean look at some of these things. All right? Look at uh you know, lovers of money. Man, people are lovers of money everywhere. Right? I think the end of it, though, with the, the lovers of pleasure, we, we have so many available distractions now. And the, the opposite of that is the, the, instead of loving God. And and then I think it gets specific, too, with, with the idea of not relying on the power of God mm -hmm. or believe, basically believing in the power of God, which means that you're, you're relying on yourself and yeah. the power of yourself. We have, a, we have a world that's just inundated with that. So right? We've, we've got all these habits and instincts as humans and as sinners mm -hmm. and it's really easy to fall back on those whenever you're not introducing God into your life on a regular basis okay hold on to that thought I'm going to get to it back in a minute yeah what did you just what say we needed somebody to pull us back in line perfect perfect because that because goes that, what, that segues that's together head. because if, if we're if we're getting involved we need someone that, that's clarity of thought and saying wait a minute don't go here yes that's why a mentor is so important that's why somebody that you that you open yourself up and say look I've got these issues. I need some. I need some help. You know. I mean, I got. I've got issues that I need to deal with, and I don't know how to deal with them. And and then stay stay through the through through the discussions when you don't like that person very much. And what comes from you could also go down to your kids. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. You know. I, I think. I think it's never too late to start training and teaching. Yes. Never. And that's Roy told me. That first thing you have to do is. Get into the church and get your kids in in church. Get them in Sunday school mm -hmm. so they can start learning. Yeah, yeah. And it paid off. Yeah. Today. Yep. <laughs> sometimes it takes a while. Well, well hey, to, you know, sometimes we get away and we realize we made a mistake and we come back. You know? So when you when you've gotten away, you look at this and said, "Man, I, I was, man, yeah, man, I, well, I was in the middle of all that stuff. I was a very weak person too. Yeah. Yeah. And when I lost Roy, I lost but i was well roy was your mentor yes he, he, he was your he, he was your mentor he and when he me. died and he didn't die because he got sick he died boom and he was over and he brought me back when i i was in corpus and i had trouble with my marriage i was married one time before bad and uh he, he told me look you need to straighten up take care of your job you got to have money you got to have you know get your life right and he brought me back. Yeah. 
for those you don't know who Roy was, Roy, if you if you go out there and look right before you, as you walk in and look to the right, and that picture on the wall, that was Roy McLaurin. That was his yeah. brother. Roy was one of the ministers here. Mm -hmm. Roy Roy went to uh, went to Sunset when he was fifty years old or something, and graduated and became a became a preacher. And he was a uh, very dynamic, uh, very very down to earth. How many, how many of you knew him? <laughs> Some of you didn't. You know, it, 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 it's I'm telling you, you know, it's your loss. I'm serious. It's your loss, but you didn't get to know him because he was he was a he was a mentor to a lot of people. He mentored me after Dwayne after Dwayne was gone. He was a guy that mentored me when we were when we became elders. When Dan and I became an elder, and and Richard, I, I, you, me, and who it was James, wasn't it? Yo, know, Roy was the guy that kind of took us so took us under his wing and 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 you know I mean it just he just he just grew us. He grew the eldership because he grew us. He he helped to show us how to be elders, how to be shepherds, what to do and what not to do. So it was you know those people are very important in your life. It's important to stay away from this stuff. You you cannot do this on your own, okay? You just can't. God knows that. That's why he puts shepherds involved in the church. That's why shepherds' job is to, you know, our mentor's job is to keep you between the ditches, man. Keep you on top of high ground. That's a children's job. Sometimes they don't do a very good job of it, but that's what they're supposed to be doing, okay? Sometimes you say, well, I don't do a very good job of that. Well, that's fine. We're, remember, we're human beings, too, and we're susceptible to the same kind of problems you are. Got the same issues here. Now let's move on. Anybody got any questions here? All right. I told you I didn't want to. I didn't want to take every one of them. We could talk for hours on every one of them. Uh, but you know, I want to look at what it says in verse six. They are the kind. Now these are the people he said stay away from them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women. Do you think there was a problem in his day? Mm. Always has been. Huh? There always has been. Always has been is what, what Jeannie says. It's always been a problem. But here, you know, these people are looking for gullible people. I don't care if it's women or men. They're looking for someone they can twist. Satan is looking for someone who he can he can walk into your life and twist you a bit just enough to get you off track. That's what he's looking for. All right? And he, so he uses people. And he said, these are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Now, take the women part out of it. Just take anybody. All right? Got all kinds of evil desires. All of us got are, are susceptible to that. Okay? I got money, I want more money. I got pleasure, I want more pleasure. Yo, I got I've got the good things happening in my life, I want more good things happening in my life. Those those are those are issues that are uh, that are characteristic of all of us to a point if we don't work on it. And he said, he said these gullible women. He, he talks about so they must have been having a problem there. I think I think this problem has gone past women in our culture. I think there, there's all kinds of people. There's all kinds of false teachers out there that are looking for an opportunity to get in your home. Whether they're coming through the phone, through your phone, the what power getting on TV. You know, I saw one today. You know, this morning before I came over here. You know, just I mean, nonsense. Not biblical at all. Not con according to the scripture at all, but people are going to buy it. They're going to believe it, and they're going to they're going to jump into that person's life. And they're, and I look at this and it says, "Who are loaded down with sin and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth." Tell me how important, and we've dealt with this before. How important truth is? How important truth is? You have is there on 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 your job on a job you have. Is there a truth and something that maybe is, is gray? Is there a truth? Garrett, uh, you, you, uh, you weld. You're a welder. Yeah. Is there a right way and a wrong way to weld? Yeah, yeah, you got to do it right. Is there a truth? I mean, if you're welding a pipeline, Mark has been done. Yeah. Uh, they've been welding pipelines <laughs> where he's been. Is there, a, is there a truth that's involved in here? Yeah. Or is it all gray? You can just kind of just no, well, I'll just figure out. I'm doing no gray air, they check There's it. no gray air. Yeah, they, 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 they check it. The X-ray. Yeah, the X-ray. The X-ray. The X-ray. Well, make sure. You know why? Because it got thousands, 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 thousands per square inch of fuel of stuff going through that pipe. And if it blows up, you know what happened? People die. People die. That's, that's one of the only jobs that you actually get checked every time you work. You go, you know, just like a, a surgeon. So there's a truth involved. Yes. You know. 
People's lives are at stake. People's lives are at stake. You're a, you're a nurse. Is there a truth involved? If you have two bottles of medicine in your hand, you know, one of them will work, one of them won't. All right? You know, you know the, you can't give them the one, because that's not true. That It may say it, but you know it doesn't work. So you have to be on your game, right? You get checked too. People can die, right? You know, I mean, you know, Aaron, you, 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 I mean, Every one of us has a truth in our job, a truth in our in our mind that works and stuff that doesn't work. How hard is it to deal with somebody that won't go by the truth? Uh, let's go with it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know stuck, that. Stuck for uh, five hours in the hole. He's like, well, you know, I didn't. He didn't bust a cob out, so like he had hydrostatic pressure on the line. Tugging, tugging, tugging. It's like, you have to shear off and go back down. He's like, ah, oh, I think I got it. I was like, well, obviously you don't. Yeah. So, yeah, Mark, you Mark was just telling me the other day about, he said he's so frustrated because there's guys that want to do it one way and that he knows it doesn't work that way, you know? And it's and it's difficult because you, you're involved with people, you know? And then, but then we let this slide. Why is Why do we let this slide? Why do we let, you know, look at what he says again, that they're, Always learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why do we let that slide in our own life? Yes, ma'am. Because the consequences are not immediate. Because the con good point. Consequences are not immediate. Learning and learning and learning. The consequences necessarily aren't always, they, they don't always come right away. Right, guys? Sometimes it takes a while. Sometimes you got to look and say, oh, God, man, when is this ever going to stop? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's like when, if you eat that apple, you'll surely die. Mm -hmm. And then, like, they're all, he's like, you're not going to die. Eat, you know, eat it. And, you know, yep. the, you know, the truth was, like, yes, you know, I mean, you might the, not. Eat the it. truth was, good point. The truth was, what did God say? Yeah, yeah. What did, what did God Satan comes in and changes one word and changes the whole dynamic of the whole text, right? Changes the whole dynamic of, of civilization as we know it. Just one, just, he just put not in there. So how important is it for us to find truth, to learn and find truth? How important is it? If it's important in your job and your job and your job, people die if you don't. You know, Paul's got a job. You know, people's finances go down a toilet if the, if, the, if truth is not. I mean, there is a truth, right? Now, he's a tax collector. For those of you know, he's an appraiser. Yeah. Matthew, Matthew could say, well, guys, Matthew, Matthew could say, well, guys, I'm an appraiser. Yeah. Yeah. But there's truth involved, right? Okay, that was I, changing the slide I saw, word right there. there you go. I, saw, I saw a thing on YouTube the other day, and it said, four plus one is five. And I put, correct. It said, no, it's not correct. What? When did four plus one not become five? Now, I don't know. So I quit doing those things. But I said, but this is nonsense. There's a truth. If you have four apples and one apple, you know how many apples you have? Five. Right? What, what happened when it became six? That's not true. At least not the way I learned truth. So, you know, there's a truth, right, Paul? There's a truth. I mean, you, you can put the figures down, and you can, you can fudge them and change them, and what will happen? Math is still math. Thank you very much. Math is, truth is still truth. Math is still math. You know, what you can still, you know, what you still one way only. Now, you may have different ways you hold your head, and different ways, but there's still one truth. When that arc pops on that steel, it better be right. Yep. Yes, ma'am. I, I used to be trained, this is how, this is how you're supposed to do it. This is how I do it. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. No. And, yep. Correct, right? Now, don't get me wrong. There's all kinds of things that, that guys like you and I do. There's, it's great sometimes. You, there's, there's a lot of ways you can do things and get it done, right? You know, I mean, you fixing this or fixing that, you can fix it a bunch of different ways. What I'm focusing on is a place where truth is absolute. Yeah. Has to be. This is absolute, guys. There's no gray area here. You can obey, obey the truth or you're not. Right? If you're going to learn the truth, there's no, well, you can, well, God really, God will really let you do it this way. It's really okay. He really, he's going to be okay with it because you're, you've got a good heart. It's not what God says. I want to take you to text. Look at 2 Thessalonians. Just two books back. This is important, guys. Listen listen up here. We've read this probably the third or fourth time we've read this through these two letters. Okay, listen to what he said. Look at what he says in verse, uh, uh, well, verse 9. 
It says the coming of the lawless one will be in the court. We're in oh, chapter 2. 2 Second Thessalonians chapter 2. My mistake. Sorry. See, there's a truth. Can't just go chapter 3 or chapter 4. It doesn't work that way. See? It has to be chapter 2. Chapter 2. Well, let's just start in verse 10. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth. And so we say, what did he say? There are people in our, in our that we know, people in our families, people in our lives, they're going to die and go to hell. Why? Because they refuse to love the truth, be saved. God says, if you want to be saved, this is what has to happen. You have to fall in love with the truth. You can't fall in love with the gray area. Gray, so you, it, whose job is it to figure out what's gray and what's not? I ain't leaving that up to you. I ain't, I ain't leaving that up to you in my life. I'm not. If it, my soul is dependent on this, I'm going to figure it out for myself. I'm going to find out what's the gray area and what's what's the truth. What do I need to know? And then I'm going to let the chips fall where they may. I'm going to I'm going to fall in love with the truth. How do you do that? Tell me how you do that. How do you fall in love with the truth? How do you fall? In, yeah. How do you fall? How do, you know? How do you fall in love with 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 your mate? How do you do that? You have to put it in practice. You have to put in the you have to put in the work, right? Right? How do you fall in love with anything? Huh? You spend time with it, right? You know, I mean, two people meet on the internet. You can't fall in love with somebody if you don't meet them, don't spend time with them, and don't. That people do, they try to do that. What happens doesn't work a lot of times. But you spend time with someone. You know, people can meet on the internet and spend time with each other. And it can work. I've seen it happen. It does work. But you have to spend time with whatever it is you're trying to fall in love with. Yes, ma'am. I also believe that uh, love changes. It mm -hmm. grows. Uh, I love Gary. Mm -hmm. But I don't love him the same way I did when we first got there. I know. I think about murdering him sometimes. But <laughs> you didn't see the look on his face. You guys, but, we, we, have, we are online, right? Yes. <laughs> But this is going out live, right? <laughs> if, if I loved Gary now, the same way I did when we first got married, we probably would have been divorced years ago. I, I, it was I agree with you 100%. And it has to grow. Because that love, and it's the same way with the truth. You know, I want, before we get out of here, I want you to read the, the next, look at the next. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. That's scary. That's scary. God, he says, God will send a delusion. How did he send a delusion in Job's life? Or how, he sent Satan to him. You guys getting this? He sent Satan into Job's life. He said, go ahead. You have any, You just can't do this. And they did it twice, not once, twice. He went back. He said, okay, but you can't do this. What if God must have known? If he's going to send... If he's gonna, here he sent them to delusion to so they believe a lie. Look at what he said. He said, and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth and have delighted and, and but have delighted in wickedness. You delight in the things he's talking about in that chapter three, then you cannot possibly love the truth, and you cannot believe the, the truth. You're going to believe a lie. Satan will figure out a way to make you believe a lie. He will he will weasel his way into your life. He'll use somebody or something, he'll weasel into your life. That's why it's so important to find a way to love the truth. How you do that? Come talk to me if you want to know. There's there's ways to do that. You know one one of the ways. How many of you are doing a reading every every week? How many of you are doing it? That's one way. I read I read two chapters this morning before I came over here, and I found something that I'm going to put into a sermon that I didn't know was there, and I've read that book a bunch, and I didn't know that was there. You want to know? Man, I just and then and then you you get a point to a point where you get to work in people's lives. And you look say, man, God, you're amazing. You're amazing. How this how this works. Fall in love with the truth by being by spending time, like Linda said, by spending time with the truth. I fell in love with Georgia because I spent time with her, and the longer I spent with her, the more I spent with her. You know, I don't care if if everybody in that family is against her. I don't care. You know what? I'm gonna love her forever. I learned that by being being around her and growing with her. You can do the same thing with the truth. Spend time with her and grow with her. All right? We'll see you next week. We'll pick it up right there next week, guys.